in the ejaculate specimen. And a lot of times the computer will see these as cells and count them as part of the uh, concentration. However, they're not moving, they're in motile debris, and therefore they're counted as dead cells. So often you'll see a big discrepancy, uh, a very high count or concentration, but a very low motility. So the machines tend to overestimate the concentration of count and underestimate the motility. And that's a big problem sometimes as well. Um, and in general, uh, the machines they have now, the, the cancer machines, are better at uh, assessing motility and sometimes forward progression. Not everybody's got the most updated type of machinery, though. Uh, but again, this is just a, a downside of these things, which again, a lot of practitioners, OBGYNs, um, urologists, um, family practitioners that are ordering these semen analysis, they don't know the difference. And they don't understand these nuances that, again, it's not unusual in many circumstances, have a significant impact on what the actual analysis, uh, how it should be interpreted and acted upon. And this is a big one, as we'll see, the accurate morphology is just not available. I have in my office, and I use as a discussion piece, uh, an article that was published in 2001 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a classic that basically shows in IUI patients the single most important value on a semen analysis that determines outcome that has the most influence is the morphology. So when there's an isolated morphology problem in a semen sample called teratospermia, that's an isolated morphology issue, then the pregnancy outcome with insemination is three times lower than typical. When it's an isolated count problem, it's about two times lower. So in other words, relatively speaking, morphology is significantly more important as a predictor of outcome with insemination than is count. Uh, and motility, as it turns out, uh, is even more important than uh, concentration. So relatively speaking, on a basic semen analysis, morphology is the single most predictive factor for uh, reproductive potential. Number two is motility. Number three is uh, concentration. However, most people really only talk about cow. Uh, so it's an interesting phenomenon, but you know, in other words, people overlook these other things that are measured. But even so, these computerized systems often are not able to adequately assess, or pardon me, adequately assess morphology. They, again, they're pretty good at counting motility, recognizing these issues often. Uh, but uh, morphology, they're generally not very good. Again, they're getting better, uh, but you know, 20 years later, they're not that much better than they used to be. So this is a big problem with these computerized systems and certainly bigger labs that are like Quest or hospital labs that are doing a wide variety of tests on a wide variety of patients, then you're not going to um, get the most accurate sort of results because they're just interested in getting the job done in count motility. So this is just an example. This happened to be from a Quest lab, and I love this. It's old, uh, but this just, just tells a lot. And it, it shows that the concentration, uh, it shows the volume here at 4 cc's. Concentration is very high, upper limit of normal. They don't even put on here, but it's 150 million. 200 million doesn't mean that this guy's some sort of superstar. It's again on the too high end of the curve. That's a problem when it's outside the normal range that suggests that it's abnormal or atypical or a problem in general. So this is not a situation necessarily when more is better. But again, this is a computerized system and it might be overreading this. It's kind of a problem. Uh, that said, motility gives this, and then it talks about the morphology of 52%. Well, I, there's not a human being on this planet that has 52% normal sperm. I um, mean, it just doesn't exist because the system thing counts things as sperm that aren't even sperm, uh, number one, and it may be counting them as, quote, normal sperm. So it's called counting dead sperm as normal, in addition to counting things that aren't even sperm as normal sperm. So you, you get the problem. I mean, it's way, way overestimated. It's a very loose system of grading. As I use the uh, metaphor or analogy, if you're a teacher and everybody gets an A, an A doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, 
so this machine is giving way too many A's uh, and calling things that are normal that just quite simply aren't. And if you had a discerning eye, you would look at these sperms that they're calling normal and recognize that they're clearly not normal, even by the microscopic appearance. And then I love this disclaimer down here that says, the results of this assessment are not intended for evaluating morphology in patients participating in an assisted reproductive program. In other words, if you're trying to get pregnant, ignore this result. It really doesn't mean anything. It's just, it, it, it just cracks me up. Uh, so if, if you're participating in some sort of treatment, this is completely invalid. I don't know why they bother putting it on there, frankly. And, but yet that's a big problem, and you know, clearly uh, there's just a lot of issues with this, and this disclaimer, at least Quest put it on there. Uh, I respect them for that, for sure, because most of the time you don't see this. So it, it really is um, uh, better to have a trained andrologist. Um, this is uh, Kelly from our lab, who happens to be sitting right here. Uh, and uh, she uh, is looking at the specimens, and you just can't beat that. You can't beat uh, someone who knows what a good and bad sperm, uh, the difference, and because when we look at sperm and select them in the context of in vitro, we're looking at their morphology. How do you differentiate a good one from a bad one? And it's not uh, simply a random assessment. So the morphology is a big thing, and looking at the morphology properly is a big thing because it impacts how we treat people, what we do, and ultimately can affect the success of the process. So this brings us to the DNA fragmentation idea, which is again a true qualitative assessment. Um, and you know, there's been numerous, numerous studies now uh, done uh, showing that DNA fragmentation is even better than morphology for assessing uh, reproductive outcome or predicting reproductive outcome. So it's the single best predictor we have, um, even better than morphology. And you can have all other parameters be normal, and if the DNA fragmentation is abnormal, the probability of pregnancy is dramatically lower than if all the parameters were normal. So each of these things has to be taken into consideration because it, it can have a significant effect on how you manage the situation. IUI might be rendered uh, essentially ineffective in patients that have DNA fragmentation as well as other things like morphology, motility, or concentration issues. So a combination of defects is additive. Uh, the probability of pregnancy is going to be lower when there's more than one problem. Um, I mean, this just shows, this is again an oldie, uh, but a goodie, that um, the, the normal odds for pregnancy when the DNA fragmentation, or what's called the DFI score, is lowest. Uh, as the DNA fragmentation score, more percentage of uh, fragmented sperm by this test, the higher the uh, concentration of fragmented sperm, the lower the probability of pregnancy. The odds ratio becomes tremendously significant once you hit about 30%. So when in any given sample, 30% of the sperm are fragmented as determined by this test, the DNA fragmentation index, then the fertility uh, rate goes way down, regardless of other problems. This could have a count of 100 million, a concentration of 100 million, good volume, good everything else. And if they have DNA fragmentation in that 29 or above range, the probability of pregnancy is dramatically lower, and some would argue that it's zero. I'm not sure I believe that, but it's certainly significantly lower than it should be. And certainly when the is it gets into this 25 range or more now, we know that the probability of pregnancy is going to be a lot lower. And you have to look at the couple as a whole, obviously, that what are the female factors? Are there other male factors? Combine these things together because a value of 25 might be significant in some individual couple uh, when you consider their entire situation. Uh, so that said, that's going to be my segue to uh, Michael uh, Zygo, Ziki Zygo. Um, he says Zygo, I say Zygo. And uh, um, he is going to take the conversation to a, another level, but hopefully helpful. So thank you very much for the introduction. I will be uh, talking. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will be talking about DNA fragmentation and why is it good uh, to uh, know the DNA fragmentation before. Uh, 
show uh, assisted uh, uh, reproductive therapy. So something uh, so, uh, about, uh, about me. So in the field of reproductive biology, I'm, I'm uh, referred to as a sperm guy. Uh, and uh, my focus is in uh, sperm cell proteins, which are participating in events of sperm preparation for fertilization or in fertilization itself. So this is, uh, I uh, point out, uh, pointed out a, uh, some of our results uh, with the collaboration uh, with the Dr. Ailing here, where uh, they were looking for um, for uh, biomarkers or these uh, proteins which are associated with, uh, with male infertility, as, as uh, Dr. Clemente was saying. Uh, here we can see uh, the images of uh, fluorescent microscope. Uh, DNA uh, of the sperm is stained with, uh, with the DNA dye, so we can see the blue heads, and these uh, biomarkers associated with uh, infertility are these either uh, uh, red or, or uh, uh, green color. So uh, uh, just, just a quick words about the conventional versus objective methods. Uh, most of the things uh, already uh, Dr. A. Lering said. So uh, the conventional methods are uh, very basic uh, or basic uh, semen analysis. Uh, which are based on the uh, subjective judgment of andrologists. So depending how good the andrologist is, uh, the, the results are uh, as good as, as it. Uh, the uh, kind of disadvantage is that uh, there are low throughput where uh, only a sample uh, or a t a 100 or 200 sperm are assessed in one run. Uh, they belong to a frontline semen assessment and these kind of parameters are uh, assessed like sperm count, motility, appearance. And the technique used for this is live microscopy as we could have seen uh, on a previous slide from uh, Dr. Van Taylor uh, talk. Whereas objective methods uh, is, uh, are something which is, uh, which is kind of new to this, to this field and are um, like adding to uh, quality uh, determining whether the sperm is also or has uh, whether the sperm also have a good uh, fertility traits. So these are uh, actually the biomarker based evaluation uh, methods of sperm with either good or bad sperm quality. They are semi automated computer assisted. The advantage is uh, that they are high throughput. So in uh, so in one run. Uh, these methods can uh, evaluate up to uh, 10,000 sperm cells uh, within one uh, within one minute. Uh, advantage is that the numeric data are generated, and the and the technique used for the objective methods is flow cytometry, uh, which am I, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the next couple of slides. <coughs> so uh, these are the types of objective semen evaluation. Uh, Dr. Ehlering already mentioned uh, the advantages and disadvantages of computer assisted semen analysis. Uh, we have something, uh, uh, something which is uh, like staining a sperm, either they're alive or dead. So after counting the sperm, we can see uh, what's the percentage of population which which is uh, uh, which uh, with the lift sperm. And uh, as uh, Dr. Clemente uh, was talking about these fertility associated sperm markers, which stains either uh, good sperm or bad sperm. So for the illustration, this is the picture uh, where you can see that what the andrologist under the light microscope can see and uh, all these three sperm would be assessed by, uh, by an andrologist as a good sperm. However, if we used uh, these markers for sp uh, sperm for fertility, in this case, the red marker is a trait for a good sperm, while the green uh, marker is a for a bad sperm. So we can see a uh, kind of different story in here. And uh, I'm going to talk more about the DNA chromatin structure test or the DNA fragmentation test. 
so this is just the background how the DNA is uh, condensed and packed in the uh, sperm nucleus. So as uh, Dr. Clemente said, if the DNA would be unpacked, it would, uh, it would have a length of uh, three meters. And uh, uh, in, this, in this state, uh, DNA would be, uh, wouldn't be, like, uh, wouldn't be uh, transported efficiently to the site of the reproduction. And therefore, this kind of condens uh, condensation and packing of the DNA must proceed during those five and a half weeks. And then the DNA is packed into this chromatin, which is stored, uh, stored in a sperm nucleus. And as a DNA fragmentation, it is considered to be either a break in a single strand of the DNA or, or the double, uh, double break in both strands of DNA. Uh, why is uh, the causes of sperm DNA fragmentation uh, infection, smoking, drug use, heat, or psychological stre stress, uh, prescription medication. These are the main causes uh, of the DNA fragmentation. And the good news is that uh, the reduction or the removal of these, uh, these uh, contributors can reduce the elevated DNA fragmentation levels. Uh, and why is it bad? So uh, certainly, uh, because the excessive paternal DNA fragmentation uh, is associated with spontaneous, spontaneous abortion <coughs> and um, incidence of unwanted birth uh, after um, artificial reproductive therapies. So, uh, so how do we measure the DNA fragmentation? So this is the uh, aforementioned flow cytometry where we have a fluorescently labeled sperm uh, tra traveling at high speed uh, uh, through this flow cell where they are uh, illuminated by the laser. Uh, this illumination causes light scattering and fluorescent excitation and, uh, and, and uh, this light and uh, fluorescence is then uh, collected in these detectors and sent to the uh, computer for analysis. <coughs> so how do we uh, measure the DNA fragmentation? Uh, so we have something uh, which is uh, called sperm chromatin structure assay. Uh, we use uh, this uh, fluorescent uh, dye, acrid in orange, with, which has this kind of characteristic that it binds to either uh, both non-fragmented and fragmented DNA. And when we, uh, when we flash it with a laser, uh, the uh, undamaged DNA emits green light and uh, fragmented DNA emits red light. So if we could have a look under the fluorescent microscope, we could, we could have <coughs> seen uh, these uh, green hats with, which contain, uh, green sperm hats which uh, contain uh, non-fragmented DNA, uh, moderately fragmented DNA with a, uh, with a yellow hat uh, to uh, orange hats and uh, orange hats of sperm and these uh, red Red uh, sperm had they have a severe DNA uh, DNA uh, fragmentation. Um, uh, this is something which we uh, this is a result from a flow cytometry. So uh, here this is a called a scatter plot where a scatter diagram where each this single dot represents one cell, uh, one sperm cell. So we can see that there are like a lot of sperm assessed. And what we can see here is that uh, on a horizontal axis, there is a red fluorescent intensity. So those sperm with DNA fragmentation would appear here. Uh, while on the vertical axis, we have a non-DNA fragmented sperm. Uh, here is the cell debris, what has been, uh, uh, what Professor, uh, what uh, Dr. Ehlering has been talking about. And, um, and uh, moderate DNA fragmentation would, uh, would, uh, would appear uh, in, this, in this quadrant of the graph. So this, uh, this is what the actual clinical result of the um, structure of the SCSA uh, uh, looks like. What we are looking for is the D, uh, DNA fragmentation index, which is, uh, which is calculated according to this formula. So, uh, red fluorescence divided by total fluorescence, we can have uh, either the uh, 
absolute number of uh, DNA fragmented sperm or the percentage of the population. So this, this is the graph what we have seen on the previous, the previous slide. Here we can, uh, the uh, red fluorescence on the horizontal axis, uh, right, uh, uh, green fluorescence on the vertical axis, and here we can distinguish four sperm population. Uh, this population is uh, DNA non-fragmented, uh, healthy, uh, well, DNA non-fragmented sperm. Here we can see uh, moderate level of DNA fragmentation, high level of, uh, high level of DNA fragmentation, and here, uh, we can see the population of uh, something which is called cells with high green fluorescence, and that these uh, these sperm are considered to have immature chromatin. Uh, to make it to make it more simple, uh, uh, we can uh, we can put a DNA fragmentation index on the horizontal axis, where we can uh, have uh, zero to hundred percent, and against uh, the total DNA stainability. This is more understandable in the case that, in the, in the words that here we have the non-fragmented uh, DNA sperm, need, uh, moderate fragmented uh, DNA sperm, and high, uh, sperm with high DNA fragmentation, or uh, this graph just uh, represents the sperm count. So we can see that, that the sperm with uh, non-fragmented DNA represent uh, this, this high peak. Uh, while the moderate and high, high DNA fragmentation is not really abundant. Uh, what we are interested in the numerical data is DNA fragmentation index, so we can see a relatively low DNA fragmentation, and we are also uh, wondering about the uh, high, uh, high uh, DNA uh, staining. So here we can see that uh, both of them are relatively low. In comparison to another, another result, uh, here we can see that this peak uh, with uh, non-fragmented DNA sperm is, is uh, much lower uh, in comparison to this one, and we have a more moderate DNA fragmented sperm and high DNA uh, sperm with uh, high DNA fragmentation. So if we can, uh, if we look at the, at the DNA fragmentation index, we can see the relatively high DNA fragmentation index and no one is really surprised about the pregnancy outcomes where, uh, where the patient with uh, this fragmentation uh, or the couple, the pregnancy outcome uh, would be, uh, was positive while here it was uh, negative. So this is how the actual clinical report looks. Uh, if you're interested uh, in this, uh, you, uh, it can be found on uh, this uh, web, uh, websites. Uh, what, uh, what we can see here is the second and the third graph uh, of, of the previous slides. Uh, total DNA fragmentation, uh, high DNA staining. But what does these values uh, represent? Represent So uh, they, are, they are related to natural and intrauterine conception. So in, in other words, uh, fragmentation below the 15% represent an excellent to good sperm DNA integrity and uh, between 15 to 25 uh, sperm DNA, uh, good to fair sperm DNA integrity. Uh, below, uh, below, this, below this line, uh, it, is, it is not advised for the, for the couple to undergo uh, natural or intrauterine insemination conceptions, but otherwise it is uh, advised uh, the change of the lifestyle, medical, uh, medical intervention, or uh, just skipping to in vitro fertilization or intracytosol sperm injection for greater, uh, greater pregnancy uh, success. So uh, with this information and also uh, uh, high DNA staining, uh, about 25% uh, is considered negative for pregnancy. Uh, we should be also uh, look, uh, look at. And with this information, I thank you for your attention and I wish you luck on your journey.